Welcome to Defining Dad Bod, where we work to untangle the messy knots of the health and fitness industry as if your children's lives depended on it. Because they do. This is where we decide to make our bodies stand for something bigger than ourselves. This is where we find practical wisdom to live by, one powerful conversation at a time. May the words spoken here inspire you to keep moving forward no matter where you are. Who knows who you could be if you could become 1% better every single day. We can do the show thanks to the support of listeners just like you. For more information how you can become part of the inner circle, go to findingdadboy.com slash inner circle. What's up, guys? This is Alex Van Houten with Defining Dad Bod. I hope you're doing super well. Today's conversation is a very interesting one. I'm excited for you to hear it. If you remember back in April of this year, I put out episode 90, which was six things that have gone horribly wrong in the health and fitness industry. I had the opportunity recently to engage with my trainer group through Trainer EDU and ask over 500 professionals what they thought was the most frustrating problem in the health and fitness industry. And then I got together with my buddy, Coach James Westfall, who has more certifications than I can fit into two minutes. So I'm not going to talk about it here, but he's been a guest on the show before. So you can go hear about his credentials and story in a few other episodes particularly episode 38, what you should know about your kids in sports with Raptor Sports Performance. Coach James and I went live on YouTube through Trainer ADU to talk through what trainers found to be the most frustrating things in the health and fitness industry right now. Now, it's very possible that you listening to this are not a personal trainer. So why am I bringing this particular conversation to you? My hope is that by looking through the eyes of the people who work every single day with individuals just like you, you'll be able to see through some of the fads, the flashy marketing, and the gimmicks that are working really hard to get your attention, but not necessarily your results. This was a powerful talk that both trainers and clients have found valuable so far, so I hope you'll find it valuable as well. Two pieces of housekeeping before we get into this. First, the Defining Dad Bod Life Transformation Virtual Coaching Trial is no longer a free week. You might remember a few episodes ago that I told you we had a few holiday spots open for the free trial for Defining Dad Bod, and those client training spots are officially filled. But don't worry, you're not too late to try virtual coaching. You can still go to definingdadbod.com slash trial and give our coaching platform a try. However, now one week of personalized coaching, including nutrition coaching, personalized exercise programming, a 30-minute consultation, and daily support and communication will cost you 25 bucks. We do a trial week around here for a number of reasons. The first and most important reason is that it's my belief that if a coaching program is not the right fit for you, and vice versa, that you're not the right fit for that coaching program, then I'd like you to know about that before you commit to a long-term program. And so our one-week trial gives you an opportunity to try me out as a coach and for me to try you out as a client. It gets you in the habit of connecting with me daily for nutrition and exercise work, as well as communicating your stress points, so that if you do decide to continue working with me after the first week, then we'll have the opportunity to create some action plans around the obstacles you faced. Which brings me to the number two reason that I do a lower cost trial week before asking you to commit to the long-term program, and that is complete personalization is only possible after I get to know you and where you're at better. Part of that's accomplished in the 30-minute consultation that comes with your week. But another part of that is understanding how you implement the program that I create for you and how you communicate your needs and whether or not you actually stick with what you say you're going to do. I have found in working with clients for 14 years that it takes me at least a week to truly understand where my client's at and how I can best get in their corner to support them. Some clients need a little more hand-holding, and that's fantastic. And some clients need me to challenge them to do better. While still others really need to talk through their options for breakfast, as well as how to bring the best mindset to their workout if they're a little apprehensive about some of the movements. 
It is a personalized experience, and I can't do that fully without really knowing where you're at. And so our trial week gives me an opportunity to get to know you so that I can deliver a very high value service after that week. The last reason I learned that it's great to do a one week trial came out of a conversation that I had with my wife when I first started this thing. She said, Alex, why do you give people a free week? Shouldn't it be like a free two weeks or a free day? That first week of training is the worst because you get the sorest during that time. And she should know because I work with her as well. I thought about it for a while and I told her, if I work with somebody who can do that first week, they make a few changes, they get pretty sore, but by the end of the week, they're ready to continue, then that's the kind of person that I want to work with. Because I know this person has the motivation and the deep why to see this thing through for the long haul. If you try my week and it makes you really sore, and some of these nutrition changes aren't for you, and you give up at the end of the week, it's probably best that we get that out of the way now, rather than four months into this thing, after you've paid for a whole bunch of help that you weren't going to use anyway. It's okay if you're not in a position and place in your life to make huge changes right now, maybe next time. In fact, most of my clients think that, but then realize they can get great results through small, incremental, and progressive changes. Our motto is 1% better every single day, and that's truly what we work toward. So if you're in the market for that, go to definingdadbot.com slash trial. The trial's not free anymore, but the one week only costs you 25 bucks, and I'll treat you with the same respect, energy, and inspiration that I treat all of my paying clients. The link's in the description below, definingdadbot.com slash trial. The last piece of housekeeping I have is to invite you to check out our training sample. Last week's show, Stop Exercising, Start Training, was a popular one. I walked everybody through general adaptation syndrome and what a real periodized exercise program looks like. It was pretty scientific, so I wanted to make sure you had a visual aid to go with the show. That aid can be found at definingdadbod.com slash training sample. Click the button, fill out the quick form, and download the PDF. It shows you in a 16-week program what phase 1, 2, 3, and 4 actually look like from a workout perspective. And if you're currently practicing writing your own workouts and working to get better at training yourself rather than just going through the motions of exercise, this can be a really helpful tool. DefiningDadBod.com slash training sample. That link's in the show notes as well. Thanks so much for joining us. Now, let's get to what's driving trainers crazy and should be driving you crazy in the health and fitness industry. What's up, guys? This is Alex Van Houten with Trader EDU. I'm joined by Coach James Westfall. James, how you doing tonight, brother? Hey, doing fantastic. Hello, everybody. I'm super excited about this. This is our first official Trainer EDU Tuesday Trainer Talk live. We've got some uh, awesome stuff going down. And James, I'm excited about our conversation tonight because we've got some pretty powerful stuff to tackle. We asked our group, Trainer EDU, we asked our group on Facebook, talk about your number one most frustrating problem in the health and fitness industry right now. Yeah. Dude, we got some doozy answers, did we not? Like, Yes, we did. Up about this. Yeah, I, I really am too, because I, I think we hit a, a key point with the group and the industry as a whole. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that we're really passionate about at Trainer EDU is doing well by our clients. And therefore, that translates to helping other trainers do well by their clients. So this is a great list. We've got a lot to go through. And then Coach Westfall and I are going to jump into the end of the conversation and tell you about the number one thing that's really getting our goat in the health and fitness world. And it was actually separate from anything that anybody else had to say, but they really hit the nails in the head. So let's start with Josh's answer. Josh actually spent the time to talk through one of his biggest pet peeves in the industry, <laughs> the standardization of education or probably a better way of putting it is the complete lack thereof in the health and fitness industry. Yeah. What is that? What's going on with that, James? You know, we have all these certifications that are available. We've got NASM, we've got ACE, we got IFA, we got all these different certifications. And people often ask you, is this one better than the other? What? And really, they're just exams. You study them, you take a test, and by that knowledge base, you're given this certification saying, I'm a personal trainer. Right. Or I'm a strength coach. 
there is no practicum. There is no internship. So they have had no practice. They could be a real estate agent working for a real estate company. (laughs) And then they could become a trainer overnight. And now you've got somebody that just read a book, took an exam that you're putting your trust into to help you change. Yes, yes. And I have first-gen experience with this. So I worked with a larger company that I will talk about later with regard to real estate and fitness. Get excited. But one of the things that we did is we partnered with the National Academy of Sports Medicine, and I was employed as an instructor of the National Academy of Sports Medicine curriculum. And so my job was to teach up-and-coming trainers how to put this stuff into practice. And what was crazy about it was the program was considered one of the most progressive and rigorous programs. And we only required 20 hours, 20 hours of client facing time to complete the program. That was the internship, 20 hours, like 20 hours. So you you read a book and you learn how to do program design, you learn anatomy and physiology and all the complex things that had to do with training. And then you only had to spend 20 hours with a client in order to pass the course. And I mean, that's more than most trainers do, but that was considered like the gold standard of qualification. And that's crazy because I mean, so you're a board certified wellness coach. You had to do a ridiculous number of hours in order to become a board certified wellness coach. And that's not even something a lot of people are talking about. Like you're still considered by most people, a personal trainer, but you're head and shoulders above somebody who's never done that before. Well, even just a wellness, depending on where you go get your behavior change or your wellness certification. Um, Mm -hmm. For instance, ACE has a health coach. That's a behavior change cert. It's a proctored exam. There's no practicum. Uh, If you move over to well coaches where I got mine, you have to not only do the the practicum, uh, which is a minimum of 30 hours and take the exam. You then have to have a coach with years of experience do a live checkout with you to make sure you know what you're doing. And they put you through the rigors. And if you don't pass it, you've got to wait to get your certification. You got to go back through the system and prove your worth. Yeah, exactly. And to me, you know, you have to do that to be a physical therapist, Mm -hmm. occupational therapist. Um, The big difference is those are state licensed positions. And of course, you know, you get into the big debate as we always do with licensure on personal trainings, a whole nother post. (laughs) <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. I mean, that's a double edged sword, right? So yeah. if you want improved standardization of the industry in order to say, you know, there's Joe Blow who can teach you how to do a proper push up, fine. But to be called a personal trainer or to be a trainer in the industry or health and fitness professional, or maybe that's one of the problems. What the heck do you call us once you're licensed? <laughs> Whatever that is. Right. Um, but when you add licensure and you add kind of that overhead, it reduces the, we call it the market fluidity in economics, which is the ability for somebody to enter the space and prove their worth by people spending money on you to keep you around and keep your practice around or whatnot. So uh, I don't really know the best answer to that question. Josh yeah. brought it up as, hey, this is a big problem, but I know it's a problem where I work as well. You know, if, if I'm practicing my stuff, my clients know after diving into my personal podcast and looking through my contributions to the blogosphere and stuff like that, they know that I'm head and shoulders above the Joe Blow trainer who just started training for you know their first month in the gym. And if that's you, I'm, I'm not dissing you. We all got to start somewhere. But they understand that I'm above there. But as far as, I don't know, a standard way of, of articulating that, in professional space, there just doesn't exist one. And I agree with Josh, it's a frustrating thing. It's frustrating that there's not a standardized methodology for education in trainers. I agree, Josh, that was that was a fantastic uh, statement and, and uh, gave us something really, for all of us to really think hard about. Mm, yeah, so here's Josh's fist, I just bumped it. Oh yeah, you can yeah. bump it too, there you go. You, you bump. <laughs> there it is, there's the camera, bam, all right. So uh, what do you got on the list? Because I, I know a couple stood out to you as well. Boy. Uh, <laughs> Where do we start? <laughs> hyped up programs. Oh, snap. Who was that? That was Kelly? That was Kelly. So hyped up programs, right? What, what is that? That's like marketing, like the biggest loser style. Like we're going to get you fit and we're going to burn fat as sweat is fat crying and pain is just weakness leaving the body. <laughs> and I'm just throwing a bunch of... Uh, that was a good there. imitation. I like that. That was good. Hey, thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that. And if you join today, you get two sessions for free and you get our state-of-the-art protein, never before seen fat burning. Anyway, um, so 
Don't worry, I won't quit my day job. But <laughs> but I think this is a really important point because when we talk about fitness programs, one of the things that I'm really passionate about with my clients is realistic expectations about their workout program and their results and what they're actually coming to me for. And I don't want to sell you too short here, but most fitness goals are a very long-term thing. They're a very, very large vision. Somebody says, hey, I want to lose 80 pounds and I want to get off my heart medications and I'd like to have more energy and I'd like to sleep better and I'd like to keep up with my kids, you know, a hyped up fitness program is only going to keep you so motivated for like a couple of weeks, you know, yeah. and that sort of change, the kind of change that's sustainable so that a few years from now, we're not still running on the hamster wheel. That is not a hyped up thing. Like, <laughs> no. like, and to be honest, I guess I always think of the difference between motivated, that's being hyped up, right? And inspired. Inspired is something that you can look into the future and chase for a while and maybe measure some benchmarks, but being motivated, that can change from day to day. If something crazy goes on at work or, or whatever, I was really on par with Kelly's answer to hyped up fitness programs. It's really frustrating to those of us who are trying to help people reach long-term goals when our clients don't necessarily know better. Like they look at the hyped up program and they're like, gee, what do you think about this or that? I'm not going to throw too many people under the bus. But the point is some of those are so marketed, so hyped up that our clients think that that's going to be the silver bullet, the one that gets them where they want to be. And that's promising a whole bunch, but not delivering. What are your well, thoughts? I, well, you know, and I think drawing on top of that, we have to think about hit training. Mm -hmm. You know, being the big fad uh, workout or the cure all to burning fat and, you know, maintaining lean mass, something that's been around since where as of the late 50s, early 60s, um, yeah. you know, through, you know, Tabata or circuit training. Then you've got the boutique gyms like Orange Theory, for example. They claim to be HIIT training and their heart rate zone based training. And you see all these, you know, I see all these people on these treadmills and we've talked about this even in our metabolic testing and proving that these people are on these treadmills running at these higher zones and all they're burning is mainly carbohydrates. And then they go home hungry and they can't maintain. And nobody has cut through the chase and taught them really, you know, why these programs are in place and why they work. And I think that kind of goes back to our first thing is the lack of standardization with training and teaching trainers, the real exercise science and getting them a practicum to say, hey, you don't start hit training with new clients. The body's not prepared. That's intensity. That's like, okay, I'm going to take somebody that's overweight that has never worked out before and I'm going to put them on an assault bike for 30 minutes. No, yeah, not just 30 minutes. <laughs> 30 seconds as hard as you can. 30 seconds rest. Yeah. 30 seconds as hard as you can. 30 seconds rest. Repeat 30 times. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. So, you know, I have a little bit of sympathy for this in one aspect, and that is that media coverage of research doesn't necessarily do the research a lot of justice. So no. we can, you, like, you'll see a headline that says something like, science proves hit burns more fat than low intensity steady state training. Mm -hmm. And you're like, wow, I guess that's better. You know, if you don't actually read the study, you're scrolling through stuff, you're like, oh, I, I heard HIT was better. I heard that's the way to go. And so when you see a hyped up, well-marketed program, and you're like, well, they're doing high intensity stuff. And that guy looks like he's sweating his butt off. So that must be HIT. That must be the way to do it. But if you read the research and it's like you had 16 college age males who went through an eight week program compared to 16 college age males who went through an eight week program. And we found that one group burned more fat than the other. Yeah. Here's the problem. College age males for eight weeks. I mean, duh, like higher intensity <laughs> training is going to get you better results, increased growth hormone, increased testosterone. But the question is, what about a year from now? And how conditioned is this person that we're working with and whatnot? Do they have a metabolic base, a, a cardiovascular fitness conditioned base in order to build off of? And then how is this person sleeping? Like college age male, you've got kids and you own a business, dude. Like when was the least stressful time in your whole life when you can do whatever you want and study? <laughs> awesome. But that doesn't always translate very well to the individual client. And so I think part of the thing that we can do as trainers is to actually read the dang research and understand what the implications are. Uh, so that we don't, you know, follow the rabbit trail and hurt some people and get bad results before we have to learn better. Yeah. And I think sometimes the industry 
takes a little bit advantage of these facts as we seek instant gratification in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And so they market it to the people that are looking for that quick uh, fix and they grab the money because not everybody, you know, we, we have to face it. Every industry has the money grabbers. So we fight that as well. And I, I think that's going to be a continuing problem regardless. But I think you you hit it really well is they blow the research out of proportion. They make it really big. The public doesn't know any better. And so they go back to their trainer. And depending on what the trainer does know and, and what they've been taught, or if they've been put in that position that they have to meet a sales quota over the health of the client, now they're just trying to survive. Mm, yeah, I read an article recently called In Defense of CrossFit. It was actually kind of a cool article, especially since this guy had already written like 12 other articles ripping CrossFit a new one. So one of the things that he talked about there was that there's a large group of people who would have never, ever stepped foot in the fitness industry, never put money down on a program, never joined a gym, never done this, but the friends really into CrossFit and they heard it was really cool. So they tried it. And so, you know, maybe they got hurt. Maybe they hurt their shoulder. Maybe they didn't get the results they wanted to see, but then they're like, well, I really liked my coach. He was really motivating. Maybe I should hire a real trainer. And sorry, if you're a CrossFit person who's also a real trainer, I'm not dissing your education there. But point is, some of these really hyped up high intensity programs, they get people to try it at least. And I hate that they have to, you know, go to the school of hard knocks and fall on their face and get tendinitis and stuff before they're like, hey, maybe there's something to this exercise thing. And maybe I should do it right this time. But there is something to be said about I've Personally, I'm not a great marketer. I'm, I'm not the guy who's going to get all flashy in your face and, and tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to be like, hey, you have some goals. Let's, let's, let's create a real thing to get there. And I can thank the hyped up industry for at least 90% of my clients who were like, yeah, I've tried just about everything and nothing works for me. So I'm um, coming to you because you sound like you know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Crazy stuff. So I have a little sympathy for it, but it also burns my butt too. I see that and I'm, I'm just not willing to go. I'm not willing to go there for my personal practice. I know you feel similarly. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, I can't, you know, I, and I think that comes down to each personal trainer's values. You know, a lot of us get in this industry because we either had a path and came from fitness from a place where it helped us and we wanted to help somebody else. Or it just came to us as, hey, you know, I really want to help people. I might be naturally athletic or this person, or we've had somebody that's close to us that struggled. And we really enjoyed the fact that it's its own reward in being able to help somebody get better and, and perform better. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, man. So <laughs> I, I want to talk about uh, another James. So not you, yeah. a different James. And he is really frustrated about the one size fits all programs. He's really frustrated yeah. about I mean, you've seen it, right? Like I actually get asked for it pretty often. People will come to me and they'll say, hey, if you can just give me a program and a meal plan, I'll be good. I can just do it. So he's really frustrated about that, both from a, a market perspective and a consumer perspective. So what are your thoughts on the one size fits all trends in the industry? My, my thoughts on that are like we've often spoke, one program doesn't fit all. Cookie cutter routines don't work and neither do diets. I mean, we've got the paleo diet, the ketogenic diet, the Adkins diet. We've got all these different diets and people are like, you know, they're wondering what to do. Mm -hmm. And we get bombarded with so much. And I think it really comes down to what's sustainable, what works for the client and what they have for an environment as a support system. And how can they change? How much can they change? Uh, because we all know that if you change too much too fast, it's not sustainable. That's exactly right. And when I consider for a client, they'll come to me and they'll say, hey, I, I saw that guy. He got really good results with your program. I want his program. So I'm like, okay, do you have the same number of kids he does? Are they the same ages? Do you have the same job he does? Because, the, you know, that's going to matter. Or do you travel for work? Do you have any injuries that matter? Is your ethnic heritage Norwegian with a little bit of Irish mixed in? <laughs> were, were your parents also obese? I start asking interesting questions ah. to say like, hey, man, what worked for him to get him from point A to point B? The exercise science stays the same, okay? Like that doesn't change. Exercise science, nutrition science, I mean, we're making progress, but by and large, we have a lot of things figured out. What changes is how you apply those things to your individual situation with your individual genetic background, with your individual obstacles and likes and dislikes and stuff. And that's personal. Like, that's why it's called personal training, because that's a very individual, not one size fits all, one size fits one person thing. It's like the difference between going to Old 
Navy and buying a suit jacket and going somewhere else where they can actually tailor that. And it's like, hey, are you 36R? What length are your arms? How big is your neck around? Because that is going to affect whether or not you buy that jacket or that jacket or if we tailor it and stuff. And that's the difference. You know, you want to go to Old Navy and buy a one size fits all workout program, then you can Google it. Great chest day, awesome meal plan. Let's see if you find anything interesting. But if you're interested in actually achieving results and you'd like to cut through some of the guess and check for yourself, uh, one size isn't going to do it. I- I'm ranting. What, <laughs> any no. additional thoughts there? Because I, I feel really strongly about this. <laughs> I, I, I do as well. And and we've seen the results. You know, yourself, you've been doing metabolic optimization and testing far longer than any of us and really have a wealth of knowledge when it comes to that. And from what you have taught me and what I have seen in the feed feedback and the case studies it's proof that through the highest technology we can we can muster right now as personal trainers the facts are there you know not everybody's metabolism the same and food impacts that as well as exercise and each person will react differently so i'm right there with you you've got to tailor the program the best way you can and i think that goes back to some of our other things is there's a reason why we have registered dietitians you know i still think it's very important to know about the nutrition systems and how we uh, use our macronutrients and how they're absorbed uh, bioenergetic systems very important. And uh, I think that comes with time. And I think with working with other trainers that are skilled and working with dietitians, that's something people can learn. Yeah, absolutely. So here's an example. Should you take a multivitamin? Yes or no? And that's a big can of worms, right? But one of the things that I thought was really interesting, uh, a recent study showed that consuming a pharmaceutical grade multivitamin, okay, not the men's one a day from your local Walgreens, but consuming a pharmaceutical grade multivitamin in obese individuals, There was actually a change in the gut microbiome in response to that over a three-week period. Was it a positive change? Did it make big differences for them? We don't know. But we also found that there was a similar effect in individuals who are being treated for ADHD, especially young children. Young children who are being treated for ADHD, they also had a group one one was treated with the amphetamines that are part and parcel of treatment for ADHD. And then there, there was a group who did the amphetamines, but also were consuming multivitamins. And they followed up with a study a year later. The group who had the multivitamin had a change in their microbiome and experienced less symptoms even without taking the ADHD medication. And so there might be, there might be positive, powerful differences on the individual level as small as what kind of bugs are crawling all over you and in your gut from something as simple as, should I take a multivitamin? Yes or no? Like, <laughs> that might be like, hey man, James's microbiome, fantastic. No ADHD in his world, awesome. He's eating a lot of vegetables and the man's in great shape, awesome. No multivitamin needed for you unless you just really wanna. And then, you know, you've got squirrel following ADHD Alex over here. Um, and <laughs> I'm not that bad, I'm a little bad. <laughs> I have no room to talk. So maybe a multivitamin would be you know, powerful and, and positive for me, but we don't know. We just don't know how deep that goes. And we're starting to learn those things. Uh, but the one thing we do know is that one size does not fit all. It just does not. No, they, they say disease starts in the gut. And if you talk to neuropathic uh, physicians, chiropractors, uh, they're under the, the general consensus. And you can see some of the research studies that show that gut health has a big determination on some of the things that are happening along with our, uh, our diets because we're doing so much processed food. Our guts get overburdened with yeast mm. as the main bacteria. And some of the other bacteria takes a big seat. And then that affects absorption rates. So we're learning more and more every day and and it's exciting, but it's also can be very confusing. Absolutely. Yeah. So coming back to the things people had to say, uh, one, one really stuck with me and uh, all of these are cans of worms worth an hour. Okay. So Jay, Jay says, all right, the whole social media influencer thing driving me crazy. And it's not just like social media influencers are annoying and evil. He's saying that the idea that the more followers you have, the better you understand exercise, nutrition, lifestyle change, and are qualified to give advice, that's driving him bonkers. So <laughs> where do you stand on this? How, how does it make you feel that Joe Blow, great photographer with an iPhone guy, has a million followers and everybody wants to know what he thinks they should be doing for bicep curls? Well, before we go there, make sure you look down below and click the like link and hit share. (laughs) Yes. Yes. (laughs) That's for you, Jay. (laughs) We'll we'll get to how important that is in a second. All right. No, really, though. (laughs) Society has always looked at people like movie stars, 
people that are in the media as supposedly the professionals. So they figure that if there is 1.5 million subscribers and 500,000 views, there must be something to what they're watching. And, you know, after they put their truck brakes together wrong three times, and then they go over to the certified mechanic that has 100 views and find out how to fix it, they start to realize really quick, hmm, maybe that guy is just getting lots of money for me clicking on his videos. Mm, yeah, well said. <laughs> I, well, follow the money, right? I mean, it's yeah. it's kind of important. This is something I braved about on my podcast recently. So in my business, I run a podcast. And one of the things that I thought was really important was to have that podcast funded by the listeners, as opposed to affiliating with products and stuff. Because I know in the training industry, there are a lot of supplements out there and a lot of people who want you to buy their kettlebells yeah. and all that stuff. So I can't operate impartially if whoever's paying the bills is also telling me what products are the best. Yeah. So one of the things that you, you see when you go to an influencer is if you click on their website and you read through their stuff, there's a protein powder that they want you to buy, or there's, you know, their line of exercise, you know, apparel or whatever. It's, it's like the platform that they're standing on is to show you the products that you think might help you look like them. And that's a problem. Just because you're really flashy on social media and you get likes and follows doesn't yeah. necessarily mean you understand the science or understand what the individual differences between people are. It is a frustrating thing. I kind of talked about this with marketing. For those of us who spend more time and energy on the programs of our clients and less time making it flashy for the internet, there's a quality issue there I see developing for sure. True story, there was a Instagram model that was posting all these workouts and meal plans. And I thought, you know, it's, it's pretty good video. It looks pretty impressive. I want to ask this person what they're doing for their diet regimen. And I asked her and she didn't really give me the uh, an answer that would come back as valid. And so I asked a couple more questions. And then all of a sudden, later on, I get this message to me, you know, hey, just FYI, my coach is the one that does all of my meal plans and workouts. I really don't know a whole lot about this. I'm just posting. <laughs> Please quit asking questions. Wow. That's so wild. It, it does happen and it's unfortunate, but at least this person, you know, finally, I think she was just afraid I was going to, you know, ask the wrong questions and she wouldn't be able to answer them without getting a hold of her coach. But finally admitted that she was just posting selfies all the time and putting up stuff and getting people to subscribe and splitting money with her coach. Yep, I can see that. I guess that that's the other thing I think that, that bothers me a little bit about the influencer thing online. We talked about the fact that the standardization of personal training education is questionable. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that. But when some, I don't know, 19 year old chick who likes to do deadlifts in front of the camera for you in short shorts, when her follower number is significantly high enough, that puts her in the market's mind at the same level as a personal trainer. And that's not the same thing. She's not a personal trainer. She's not a nutritionist. She's not a dietitian. She's not a behavior coach, right? And I think that what bothers me philosophically about it is that I want my clients to seek to be the best version of themselves. You know, I one of my clients I trained today, she's 39 years old. She's got three kids. You know, she's obviously post baby. I don't want her looking at this 19 year old girl going, oh man, I wish I had her legs. I want her looking at her in the mirror going, I'm working to better myself. My legs look better than they did, you know, a month ago. And that's going to build her confidence and help her be motivated in her own personal program and, and get excited about the changes that she's making. And I think there's an influencer problem, you know, trying to pass yourself off as an expert when you're not. But there's also a, a consumer problem. And when people follow these people, it's equipping them to do so. You know, and I think it's important, you know, if that's your value, fine, do it. But be aware of what you're supporting when you like and you share and you subscribe and you're like, hashtag fitness goals. Like, dude, you've got three kids and you're 39. Like, you're not going to be doing deadlifts with those short shorts on. And nobody would appreciate you doing that either. Neither should she in my gym. Okay, I'm going to stop with the ramp. But that's really important. I think that's really important. And that's something I, I tell my clients. So like, hey, do you follow this person? I'm like, no, I'm kind of morally against what they stand for. Yeah. <laughs> so... Moving on. All right. <laughs> so, Jay, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Yes. Uh, and, and you know, Tom had a similar quip. He, he said, I hate that in our industry, sometimes followers equal authority. And, you know, when, when you're working one-on-one -on -one <laughs> with people, you spend one hour with that one person, you take really good care of them as opposed to, you know, negative three seconds with the one million people that you have following you. <laughs> right. Yeah.
so those were the major things. Did I miss any? Did I miss miss one we wanted to talk about? No, because I think we got, I think when it comes to, I think Nate had mentioned know-it-alls. Mm. That kind of, I think that kind of falls into the same realm we were just talking about, you know, either imposters or people that are uh, stating they know all these things and they state them and they don't have any real science to pull or they've misread the science and they think they're giving out valid information and they post all these things and you go, well, you know, if you read down here, yeah, I, I think, yeah. I actually had that experience with, uh, he's a, he's a leader in our industry. He's got a PhD in, in nutrition sciences. His name's Lane Norton. And I, I put a post out on my social media and I was leading a discussion on the effectiveness of calorie counting as a nutrition tool. And one of the things that I put out there was, you know, I'd love to debate another coach who's really good at this and knows their stuff and, and can have an intellectual discussion about this. And that is willing to have a conversation about how effective this is as a tool with clients, because it's been my experience that there are many other things that I can focus on with clients that get more bang for the buck with regard to general population, health and fitness and body composition change. So anyway, that being said, Lane had several people who I guess are followers of his. They were like, oh my God, Lane, you should do this. Uh, he will crush you. It'll be a lecture. You know, anyway, it was a really interesting thread. <laughs> so I actually brought him on the show. He took an hour out of his day, came on the show, and we had a great conversation. There was nothing contentious about it. What was really interesting about it is he and I were both interested in our methodologies as coaches, but also open to the methodology of the other coach. And I think one of the things that's interesting about the internet is when there's a guy behind the keyboard who knows it all. <laughs> it's really easy to type those things out. But when you're face to face with somebody like you and I are, or at least or virtually face to face, yeah. then you find that the conversations are much more nuanced. You know, you can say you can't cheat thermodynamics. Okay, that's an all encompassing statement. Great calories in versus calories out. But when we actually got down to the nitty gritty, Lane was just as forthright as I was in saying, hey, every person I've ever coached has been different. N equals one. Something that works for the average person doesn't necessarily work for every single person. And there are willpower constraints and there are other factors that might be involved, microbiome and measurement errors notwithstanding, right? And it was a great conversation in the sense that a know-it-all or a presumed know-it-all, at least by his zealotous followers, <laughs> was open to a much more nuanced conversation. And, and I think you and I would both agree that the nutrition and exercise science has a lot of nuance in it. So yeah. anybody who says they know it all obviously either one has not been the industry very long or two is just really confident behind their keyboard about getting your goat and perhaps they need to learn the hard way you know i think the day any of us think we know it all it's time to hang it up uh <laughs> you know when you got together with me and chris and fortunate to have a lot of our viewers and followers and, and people that are in our group we've learned something from everybody mm. And I just feel fortunate enough to be able to not only be part of a group, but with Trainer EDU, I've had, I've learned tons from yourself, you know, to be able to talk to somebody one-on-one -on -one and see the opposite side of the coin mm -hmm. and actually go, you know what, that could work. That could make some sense. There are no really absolutes. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that speaks volumes for our industry. If more of us would step back away from our brick wall, so to speak, and start meeting each other at the picket fence and talking like neighbors across the fence, we could have some very accommodating and very uh, educational conversation. Mm, yeah, I agree. And on that note, I would invite anybody who's listening, if you're joining us live, James and I are, are going to share our number one thing that's driving us bonkers in the industry. So get excited and stay tuned. But if you haven't subscribed to our, our YouTube channel, you can do that with the button and then you can click the little bell so that next time we go live like this on, on Trainer Talk Tuesday, you can get that notification. But I'd also invite you to join us in our, our group. So we have a Facebook group. It's called Trainer EDU. And uh, there we have great discussions, great conversations. It's an amazing resource. We've got almost as many veteran trainers and doctors in there as we have people who've trained less than five years. I mean, that's that's saying something in a group of almost 500 people. So you can find out more information. I, I've got the link in the, the comments below. That's traineredu.live slash tribe. So James... I'm ready for your rant, dude. What is driving you crazy? You saved it. You didn't put it on the thread. So what's driving you crazy in our industry? Youth fitness hashtag high school coaches. <laughs> I am so livid about this. 
So we've got all these special teams. They're having the kids go out and do special teams and do 20 or 30 games and five practices. They're training these kids as though they're college athletes when they're, you know, 12, 13, 14 years of age. They've done no base training, none. I mean, you've heard me all the time. You don't take and build a brand new house on a crumbly old foundation. You build from the bottom up. And it's tough. I have to feel for the teachers. I'll I'll back off a little bit. The math teachers, social studies teachers, English teachers get put in the position of, well, you know, we're going to coach football, so we're going to step in the weight room. But because they lifted 20 years ago, uh, they think that they're going to teach, you know, these kids the same thing. Mm. And they've either lost their skills, don't have the skills, or think they've got the skills, and it becomes a mess. Well, and, and most of them, so so you're speaking from the position of a father with two boys who right. one's a teenager and one's about to be, like he's pretty close, right? Right. A- and a certified personal trainer. Most high school football coaches are not certified strength and conditioning no. coaches, No. right? So, so they got these boys in here doing power cleans, deadlifts, heavy squats, bench press, right? And I mean, I, I, I worked out in a high school weight room. I, I didn't break anything, which was nice, but I have no idea what that dude's credentials were. I remember one quote, I was 16 years old and the dude said, he goes, we're just going to work on building a lot of muscle right now. Cause when you get on the wrestling mat, everybody knows that your opponent's just scared of you. If you have muscles coming out of your ears. And I swear I did more curls in that workout than I've done in my entire, like ever since. I think I did more curls in that workout. <laughs> like we were, we were like preacher curls we had like <laughs> close narrow grip pull-ups and we're like dumbbell curls. I didn't know there was another muscle outside of my biceps, but man, we were, my biceps hurt for days after that. Yeah. That was our weightlifting session. That's yeah. all I remember of it. So that's really driving you bonkers. I know there are some things that you've personally done to try to fill this gap and and make things better, namely training your boys out of your own home gym. But uh, what in your mind needs to be done about this? Well, you know, I don't only just see it there. I also see it in the physical education teachers. Um, They come in, they teach phys ed, but phys ed is so watered down from when we went to school, especially when I went to school and we were running from dinosaurs. Um, (laughs) When I was your age. (laughs) <laughs> but but yeah. so anyways, I see PE teachers that come in and they only have to teach a certain curriculum. And when they have to go outside of that and start teaching like a fitness class, they have no clue where to start. They get pressure from the parents to, oh, I want my child to do this. I want my child to do that. And they have no way of explaining to them why they shouldn't or should be doing something different. Um, because also as a physical education teacher, they're not strength coaches. They're not personal trainers. They know the very basics of the basics in exercise science. More of their skills are taught on 30 credit hours of how to teach somebody something. Right. Education. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and the coaches, again, it's, it's one of those things. Now I've tried to go in the community and coach. You've got some people that are very accepting and grateful of that. And then you have your others that are like, I don't know, some reason they think a strength and conditioning coach is a rock star glorified position, which it's all but that, (laughs) you know, and I've been fortunate to have kids that are grateful and it's been nice to work with them. Um, it's nice to work with my own boys and Cole just came home today. He went up another five pounds on his weights. Yes. He's doing Bulgarian split squats and he's got 30 pounds in each hand now. And I'm like, holy cow, dude. And he says, yeah. And he says the PE teacher just added Bulgarian split squats to their routine. (laughs) Yes. I'm taking like, notes by the kid. Yeah, but he's he's gaining and other kids are seeing that and they're starting to go, Cole, why are you doing this? Or yeah, and he goes, doing? How do I do yeah, that better? How do you do that? And he's like, Well, you know, my dad shows me this and you know, they go talk to their parents and you know, once in a while you get a call and they go, you go, Yeah, sure, bring them over. You know, I was gonna say before long you're gonna have like 13 kids in your, your shop there. <laughs> like you're walking, like what is this party? And I missed out. <laughs> uh, I, I I don't know. I think the only thing that needs to change is so the state of Nebraska, for example, out by Lincoln, they now have hired three strength coaches to take care of a school district. Mm. So they might have six schools where they got three trainers because they couldn't afford to put in the budget, you know, to have a strength coach at every location. Which to me, kudos to them. They're trying. Yeah. 
I think that would be a, a really good thing to say, hey, let's employ a strength coach per three schools. Let them oversee the and help the, the teachers, coaches, and put a program together that's safe and effective and teach the kids. And let's really educate them on staying safe. Let's do some biomechanics and, and make sure that when uh, six foot Joe, that's 14, goes to do a squat and he comes up on his toes while he's squatting because he has no posterior flexibility, uh, we can fix that. Yeah, we can bump the weights down and, and lead them through a few mobility drills and do yeah. them right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that so I'm off my high horse. No, no, that's good though. I th- I think that's really powerful. I've got I've got two boys. They're nowhere near the age as yours are, four and eight months. Um, so it's gonna be a while before they're in high school lifting weights in the weight room with the guys. But I want the person coaching them to do a good job because I know how easy it is to hurt your back and mess up your knees and ankles and shoulders and stuff while you're growing. You know that yeah. big influx of testosterone and growth hormone hits you and you start lifting weights and you do it poorly. I've met a lot of trainers who have become trainers because they've rehabbed a lot of injuries through high school sports. That's what their first lesson in biomechanics was. And one of the biggest pet peeves from the college coaches is high school athletes that get recruited come in completely unprepared for a program. Mm, Yep. Like not understanding how to follow one, not understanding how homework works or how to prepare, how to recover. Or yeah, or, or condition for it. Okay, that's a good one. Alex, I've got to hear yours. Okay, (laughs) that's a good one. Mine's completely unrelated to that. So here's my pet peeve. I feel strongly enough about this that I spent 30 minutes yakking about it on my show. And my wife says that's a good thing. I've got a podcast because otherwise she'd have to hear about this. So here's my thing. I am just absurdly angry in the industry about real estate companies masquerading as fitness companies, Mm. real estate companies who masquerade as fitness companies. Uh, So I have have a small story and I'll try not to diatribe too long here. So I worked for Lifetime Fitness, very, very large luxury gym chain. I think they've got like 127 locations nationwide and even in Canada at the moment. Cool place, super cool place. And when I first started working there was uh, was a decade ago, shortly after the recession and they were awesome. They were a publicly traded fitness company. I think they were being sold at like $40, $50 a share something like that. And it was a great place to work out. They were gung-ho about super educated trainers. Like you had to have a ridiculous level of education to get hired there. They had education programs to help the trainers understand more about metabolism and nutrition and, and exercise. I learned so much in the first three years I was there. And then we heard that the company was sold and they went private. And I didn't understand what that meant. I didn't understand, you know, I wasn't a big money capitalist. (laughs) I'm still not a big money capitalist, but I didn't understand how that worked. And then I watched the movie, The Founder. Do you see that? It was about the McDonald's guy, the guy who's Ray Kroc, you know? So he's running this fast food franchise and he's making like less than pennies on the dollar. And the guy comes in and he's like, oh, you're in the wrong business. You need to be in the real estate business. And so what he does is he turns his institutions into places that collect rent. He buys the land and he collects rent from the franchisees and he lets them deal with the profit issues, right? So that's how he makes his billions. That's what happened when our company went public to private. I didn't know this. So they sold from $40 a share to $75 a share. But what I didn't know is that they changed their status as a company. They were publicly traded as a fitness company, like health and fitness. So they were interested in the results of clients and they were interested in whether or not their supplement line was great. And they were interested in whether or not their trainers were educated. But then they sold their real estate at 70 odd dollars a share, made a great profit off of the sale. And they were interested then at that point in building as many clubs as possible so they could resell in five years and you know, make money on their investment. So I'm a trainer. I don't, I don't know what all this means, but what I found out later as things changed month to month is a fitness company is interested in how their people are eating, how their people are exercising, whether or not they're getting, you know, progress on their results. They measure their success on whether or not people are inviting their friends because they're getting great results at lifetime. A real estate company doesn't care what you do with your health and fitness even more so doesn't care what your trainers are doing with your health and fitness. What they're interested in is getting enough renters into the door to pay for the mortgage of the building so that they can go build more buildings. And I had no idea. I didn't know how this worked or or anything. What that meant for me though, was that uh, I saw a significant decrease in the company, their emphasis on my client's results. 
and a significant increase in the company's interest in my sales revenue. Mm -hmm. So it became like a retail sales position. Like you should sell more training. You should sell more training. Hey, this person lost a hundred pounds. Yeah, that's cool. You should sell more training. And I also saw a decrease in my paycheck as the percentage of money came out of the commissions. So a lot of trainers don't know this when they're looking for jobs. They see places like Gold's Gym. They see places like 24 Hour Fitness. They see places like Lifetime Fitness, Equinox. They look at these places and they're like, okay, that'd be a great place to work. But they don't understand is that if it's a real estate company, then that company doesn't really care whether or not you as a trainer get people great results. What they care about is the dollars that you bring in and how many renters you draw in with you and, and keep happy, right? So all that to say, I'm not saying people shouldn't work at these places. They're great places to work, but you should understand what you're getting into. You should understand that you're joining a real estate company, hopefully to learn as much as you can in those high dollar spaces so that you can go do right by people somewhere else, perhaps. But I had no idea. I didn't know this you know, after after several years of working there, as they kind of snowballed in that direction, I felt more and more like I was trying mm -hmm. to, you know, hold up the integrity of the training business, despite my company's desire to just sell the next multivitamin or whatever it is. So anyway, all that to say, that's my biggest pet peeve. That's the thing that's most frustrating to me in the industry is real estate companies who are masquerading as fitness companies and clients and trainers don't actually know that that's what's happening. So no, 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 you, because you hit it on a great point, because it's not only just that institution as a real estate, but we also look at that from other big box companies that are out there. I mean, that one was significant. You and I met through that organization, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, if I got anything out of just going to the work there, it was, you know, us working together in friendship. That was worth it. <laughs> um, but, you know, I look at the other big clubs that are out there and the trainers go in there and nobody teaches the trainers sales or marketing mm. or how to do it in a way that is not going to alienate people that are trying to work out. Sure. A, a high integrity, like uncompromising quality way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so you hit the nail on the head there with, you know, they're always trying to generate the sales and they care less about the outcome of the client. So yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm right with her with you. It was awesome. Oh, well, thanks for that. I'm glad I got that off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked you, what can we do about that? From my perspective, the reason the real estate business is helpful is because we can make advances in health and fitness. Like we can, we can educate with that amount of capital and stuff. That's great. What we do about that though, is if you are working in those high dollar spaces, two things. One, you're not crazy. Your company really does only care about whether or not you sell training and you're not going to change that period. Like they don't care what your results are. So, I mean, if you're going to keep working there, that's, you just got to swallow that. Right. Second is uh, learn as much as you possibly can in that environment. You're around other trainers. You, you have a, a high level of investment capital mm -hmm. around you. I'm sure they've got good education packages and programs and stuff to teach you up. Great. Learn as much as you possibly can so that when the time comes, you can help people uh, either in your own business or in, in a, a smaller boutique training studio or something along those lines, still get great results and, and get as much out of that, that experience as possible. That's my advice. So that's what we can do about that. Heck yeah. Um, well said. Well, man, I, believe it or not, we have ranted on these subjects for exactly one hour. So I hope it's been valuable. <laughs> I hope it's been valuable to those of you who joined us. And uh, again, I invite you, if you want to connect more with what we're doing here at Trainer EDU to subscribe, hit your notifications, and then jump into the discussion. We're going to talk about the stuff on Mondays in our group. So trainereduive slash tribe. And we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear about the things that not only are frustrating you, we're going to have some more constructive conversations soon, but maybe you can add to... As, as James kind of said, coming to the picket fence, having the conversation as people, and perhaps we can all get better together. So I appreciate your time, brother. Thanks so much for joining hey, me to talk about the too. things that are really burning us up. Thanks. <laughs> no, I appreciate the time as well. And thank you for whoever's watching. We'll leave everybody with that. And uh, until next time, guys, kick butt, take names. The free practical advice and conversations here remain unbought and unbiased thanks to the support of listeners just like you. For more information on how you can become a part of the inner circle of Defining Dadbot, go to definingdadbot.com slash inner circle.